and include your name and where you are from when you write in. We got a bunch of buy or sells this week. I haven't done too many buy or sells in a while, and I keep getting a whole bunch of them. So I figure, why not uh, throw a few in here? And we'll start with with a tough one. Clayton in Wichita, buy or sell. CM Punk's pre-pipe bomb career or CM Punk's post-pipe bomb career. And it's tough in that, I guess if you were a big Ring of Honor fan, you probably would say, oh, easily, you know, buy on on pre-pipe bomb. Because then you've got all the stuff he did in Ring of Honor and the great matches he had there in the summer of Punk. And then even early in his WWE career, I mean, he won the ECW title, he won the World Heavyweight Championship. You know, he had some pretty big matches before the uh, the pipe bomb. Straight Edge Society, the new Nexus. But I look at his post-pipe bomb career, and he was never as popular as he was during this period. He was arguably the most popular person in all of wrestling for a time. And, and they bungled it. What they could have done with him when uh, he walked out that night at Money in the Bank and then came back uh, what, two weeks later. Uh, they did bungle that. But when he came back, you know, post pipe bomb, he was he was the shit in WWE. He was the big deal, and he had these big matches with John Cena. He lost the championship. He won it back at Madison Square Garden. Had the championship for over a year, four hundred thirty four days in that time. He went from babyface to heel. He had Paul Heyman with him now as his manager. Got to wrestle The Rock on back to back pay per views. He wrestled The Undertaker at WrestleMania. Then he went, I think he went away, right, for a while, came back, came a baby face again, and he was doing the stuff with Daniel Bryan. And I mean, he and Daniel Bryan in 2012 had some great matches. I mean, their over-the-limit match was tremendous. But you had that whole triangle with Punk and Bryan and AJ Lee. But then later on, you know, Punk and Bryan basically became uh, like 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 partners almost in this battle against the Shield. And then, of course, after that, he was gone. So when I think of his post uh, pipe bomb career, I'm not even considering the UFC stuff, right? I mean, he, hey, good for him. He had a, a dream. He had a goal. He had to take a shot at it. He did, and it didn't go as well as he would have expected it to. But he took the shot anyway. It hasn't really done much of any great note to speak of in terms of his post WWE career. But even those few years after the pipe bomb were his his biggest years. And so I've got to buy on that. I'm going to buy on post-Pipe Bomb Punk and sell on pre-Pipe Bomb Punk. But if you were a big fan of his work and followed along even before WWE, you might have a different perspective than I have. Uh, Scott from Peterborough, Ontario. Buy or sell on the better match. Undertaker against Batista at WrestleMania 23. Or what should have been Undertaker's WrestleMania 22 match which is the match that he had the month before at no way out for the world heavyweight title against kurt angle had it happened here's the thing about that match though had it happened had it happened at wrestlemania it's a very good chance that the streak would have been ended i i agree undertaker and kurt angle should have been the match for the world heavyweight championship at wrestlemania 22 the match they had at No Way Out in 2006 was great. It was an excellent match. Maybe the best match the two ever had. Kurt, Kurt was just, I mean, I'm sure he was all pilled up, but he was a machine at that point. I mean, 2005, 2006, with the, with the mouthpiece and everything, Kurt was, was hurting physically, but he was like a machine in that ring, and the two of them just turned out to have good chemistry together. But Undertaker didn't win the world title, did he? So you do that match at WrestleMania, you either switch the championship, and maybe they would have. Maybe they just would have put the title on Undertaker and the finish would have been different. But if not, that streak would have ended a lot sooner than it did. But I, I just can't imagine that they would have... By then, the knowledge was already there. The knowledge was already there, you know, of the streak. There's no way they would have ended it. They would have just changed the title, would have been my guess. Uh, which match do I think was better? Which match do I like? Probably the match with Kurt. I mean, it was it was an excellent match. And the match with Batista impressed a lot of people as well, and it was a very good match, but it was not as good as the match between Kurt Angle and The Undertaker. I got to buy on that. Dave from Newfoundland, Canada. 
do you think a submission win over John Cena would be an accomplishment to build around, like, for example, defeating The Undertaker at WrestleMania? Considering the fact that he has not tapped out since 2002 or 2003, do you think this could be a defining moment for someone to build up? Cena's whole gimmick is never give up. It's on everything. It's on his, his little towel. It's on his... I don't know what that is. If that's a, a hand towel, if he takes that to the gym, if it's a jizz towel. I have no idea what kind of towel that is, but it's on his towel. It's on his t-shirts. It's on everything. It's his branding. Never give up. So yes, for him to give up, it would fly in the face of everything he represents. It would be huge. It would be a big deal. I think the last time he tapped out in a match was the same pay-per-view where Eddie Guerrero won the title from Brock Lesnar. No way out. That was 2004. That's a long time. You know, when Hulk Hogan came back to WWE in 2002, he tapped out as a babyface to the heel, Kurt Angle, at the King of the Ring. And I thought that was huge because how many times can you recall Hulk Hogan as a babyface, not as Hollywood Hogan, but as a babyface in WWE or WCW, how many times can you remember Hulk Hogan submitting to anybody? let alone submitting to a heel. It never happened. If it did, I'd love to know. I can't think of one example. I mean, he passed out in a bear hug two months later to Brock Lesnar on SmackDown, but passing out and giving up, those are two different things. So if John Cena ever tapped out to anybody, yeah, it would, it would be a big deal. They'd have to play it up like a big deal. It would be a very big deal. But it's, I mean, not on the level of beating The Undertaker, though, and breaking the streak at WrestleMania. That, that's on a completely different level. I mean, that was built up over 22 years, right? So, although, look, I guess it's been 16 years since John Cena, the babyface, tapped out. But still, I wouldn't exactly uh, make the comparison. I don't think that's what he was doing. But I would never make the comparison to The Undertaker's streak being broken at WrestleMania. But could they build that up to be a big deal? Yes, absolutely. Raj from Birmingham, UK. I'm a lifetime wrestling fan. Only discovered your podcast a few years ago. The podcasts and the live streams and sound off extras have become highlights of my week, especially now. Two questions. First, which move is more offensive in its terrible execution? The Rock's sharpshooter or John Cena's STF? They both looked like shit. Rock could just never get the sharpshooter right. I mean, rarely. One of the best ones I think I ever saw him do was in one of the matches he had with CM Punk. I actually thought that one looked acceptable. But he would he would barely crouch. It's like he would turn the guy over. And Sting was doing this at the end of his career. So the very end of his career, Sting, who was using the Scorpion Deathlock before Bret Hart was using it, uh, even he was, he would just like stand there and it's like, why even bother? If you can't like bend your knees or you don't want to hurt the guy, then just don't do it. But The Rock would do it. He would barely put any force back. I can't even say he was crouching. He wasn't even crouching. He was just, he was standing. And the funny thing about, the funny thing about The Rock when he would do it is that he always looked like he was in more pain than his opponent was. Go look at The Rock's face. He either was taking a really big shit or he was in a tremendous amount of pain. I would laugh when I would see The Rock do the sharpshooter. Now, John Cena's STF, John Cena's STF was horrendously bad. No pressure applied, didn't look painful at all. It looked like you could just fall asleep in the hold. But I guess it all stems from him applying too much pressure in the match that he had with Edge. I think they had a TLC match at Unforgiven back in 2006. And he supposedly choked out Edge legit. He applied so much pressure to this STF that he he put Edge to sleep for a few seconds there. I guess he didn't realize his own strength, maybe. Either that or he really hated Edge. But I guess he put him out with it. And uh, yeah, The match he had a few months after that with Umaga at the Royal Rumble, though, he, he wrapped that ring rope real nice and snug around Umaga's neck when he was yanking back on it. So I guess maybe he hurt Edge with it, and then after that, it's as if, you know... It, it was the complete opposite, where he wasn't applying any pressure, and it just looked completely ridiculous. He does this triangle thing, and he's not even, like, barely touching the guy. He's not even, like, yanking back on it or anything. I mean, there's a way to do it and not hurt the other person, but not make it look like shit. 
You know, I mean, it's one of the things I appreciated about Bret Hart when I sing Bret Hart's praises. He, you know, when you watch his matches, when he would do stuff, whether it was the figure four around the post or whether it was the sharpshooter, when he would put the sharpshooter on, you know, Bret would even make fun of The Rock when he would see The Rock doing that hard. And he likes The Rock, but he would make fun of him when he would see him doing that horrible uh, sharpshooter. You know, Bret's one of those guys that would make things look nice and, and, and real. You know, he didn't make it look like uh, some kind of fake play or something like that. There's a way to do it and not hurt. I'm not saying I want people to get hurt. But there's a way to do it and not hurt the person but make it look good. So, it's it's as if you're asking me to like compare the two and which is worse. It, it, it's like if somebody took a dump and there were two nuggets in the bowl. You're forcing me to choose which nugget was worse, which nugget looked nastier. At the end of the day, they're both shit. I'll 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 say the rock sharpshooter. I'll pick the rock's sharpshooter as the worst of the two. At least John Cena had a few shining moments with it. The Rock maybe had one, and that's all I can think of. It always looked bad. And what was his uh, second question? Here we go. Second question. Other than wrestling and baseball, what else are you into? Are you a gamer, for example, or do you follow any other sports? Not really any other sports. I mean, football, casually. American football. I have to be specific here. We do we do have a global audience here. American football. I used to be more of a gamer years ago when I was uh, when I was younger. I just don't have time for it anymore. I did go out and buy a Nintendo Switch two years ago. I'm so glad I spent uh, three or four hundred dollars on a Nintendo Switch that my brother plays all the time. I bought it because I wanted to play Mario Kart 8. Mario Kart 8. I love Mario Kart from the SNES days. Then I saw Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. I said, "Oh, that looks fun. I want to play." I played it like three times and I barely picked the thing up. But my brother plays it. I think now we're going to start to probably, you know, do the the dual player more often. Um, Otherwise, I've got my Wolfenstein uh, Enemy Territory game to fall back on. I did a few Sound of Gamers with it a few years ago. It's the old, uh, the Allies against the Axis. Axis? Axis. There you go. It's an old game. I've told this story before. You know, they were working on this game, Enemy Territory. Midway through development, they abandoned the game. They just, whatever they had already put together, they released it for free. Online is this multiplayer online game. And I used to play the shit out of it. I had so much fun playing that game. Uh, And then my mother got sick. That was the first time she got sick. It was 2004. And then, because I was playing this game every day, every night. And I just fell out of it at that point. I didn't pick up with it again until like, 10 years later, 12 years later, I said, I wonder if E.T. is still playable. And sure enough, not only was it playable, most of the servers have bots, but I managed to find servers that have actual human beings on them. I was like, holy shit, there are still living, breathing human beings playing this game. That's awesome. It's fun. It's fun. So I'm open to doing more sound. I hate doing sound of gamers on the same game. I know the game is old and, and now everyone's playing Call of Duty or Doom or you know, Fortnite or whatever the whatever the flavor of the month is now. But, I, you know, I don't have any of the consoles. And even if I did, I have no way to hook everything up. You got to hook it up to a TV and then the computer and you got to have the caption card. And I don't have any of this shit. So maybe I'll hop on and do more, uh, you know, enemy territory gamers with my uh, with my commentary. If people are, are interested in that, people are bored sitting at home. They want more uh, gamers. Maybe I'll do some more uh, E.T. gamers. But that but that game, it was it was. A blast playing that game. You know, there's another game that this this is a real blast from the past. I can't even believe I just thought of this. There was a game. I guess it was a role playing game, but it was it was an application. It was a program I had to download on the computer. There was a client for it. It was called Federation. I don't know how many people heard of Federation. It was a text based game. It was text based. But you would connect, and I think there were other people on there, so I think I think it was kind of like multiplayer, I think. I don't know why I just thought of this, but it's been so long since I uh, I played that. I can't imagine that game is around anymore. But that was another one. Federation. Man, you guys are bringing back all these old memories for me now. Uh, let's see. Sam from Townsville, Australia. Buy or sell? 
The Hell in a Cell match between Triple H and Mick Foley from No Way Out 2000. Or the match between Triple H and The Rock from Backlash 2000. Which match would you rather have had as the main event of WrestleMania 16? Instead of the four-way, if you could have changed it. You either have Mick Foley get his WrestleMania main event and get to retire at WrestleMania when he loses. Or have the top babyface beat the top heel for the championship. The main event of WrestleMania 2000 should have been The Rock against Triple H. And I get that they wanted to wait until Stone Cold was physically able to come back and do the run-in. And to be honest with you, he shouldn't have done it probably even in April. I mean, the man was in a freaking halo for the first like two or three months of his recovery from neck surgery. And they don't clear you from now. If you have that kind of fusion surgery, you don't even get cleared for at least a year. You know, in some cases, it's taken people a year and a half to come back from spinal fusion surgery. Austin came back in like nine or ten months, but he did a run in a backlash, and that was three months after surgery. It was insane. So WrestleMania was too early. They couldn't get him, and they ended up doing the Rock Triple H match a month later. And that Backlash 2000 pay-per-view is one of the best pay-per-views the company has ever done. I love that main event. I love that Rock Triple H. Overbooked as shit. Kind of reminds me of the Austin Dude Love match from Over the Edge 98. Also, overbooked as shit. One of my favorite matches. It's an example of how to do overbooking the right way. Those two matches are at, at Over the Edge in 98 and Backlash 2000. Two of my favorite matches. WrestleMania should have been Rock against Triple H. Leave Mick Foley and Triple H for no way out. Let Mick Foley ride off into the sunset. He put Triple H over. He did the right thing. He did the honors on the way out. And you do Rock against Triple H with Rock winning the championship. That's what the main event of WrestleMania 2000 should have been.